Okay, let's talk a few minutes about Chapter 1, Introduction to Networking. We've What is networking? We talked about that a little bit. Networking, basically sharing information. It doesn't have to be with a computer, does it? Lots of people get lots of jobs networking. You know somebody at a company, and all of a sudden a job becomes available that you may be qualified for. They tell you about it. That's a good deal, right? And it's the same thing we were talking about a little earlier. What if they told you about it in Chinese? Would that do you a whole lot of good? Wouldn't do me any good because I have no clue what it would be in Chinese. So the things that we need, what do we need to make these things work? Objectives, the advantages of network computing relative to standalone computing. Standalone computing is what we all started out with. You know, standalone, we talk about virtual machines, virtual computers. You guys use virtual computers in the last class, right? Pretty neat technology. That's how we started out. Mainframes actually created virtual machines or virtual areas within the mainframe. So we kind of go full cycle. We've gone from standalone to distributed where we have things that we share on the network, Microsoft Office, uh, Visio, you're going to use Visio here a little bit later. We share it and do the processing on the local computer. Now we've gone to what cloud apps or web apps or whatever else so that the processing takes place somewhere else. We're back to sort of like the mainframe model. The difference between web is or, or a, a cloud is there's usually a lot of backup, a lot of redundancy that goes on in it. It is, it, it is virtualization. Distinguish between client-server and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Not a really big deal. Client-server, we have a server and a client, client machine, just like you when you log on here. When you log on to your computer, you're logging on to the client. Again, the language that we use. And you're connecting to the server where your home directory is, where some other folders are that you can get to, which have been shared, but that's a whole different world that we'll get into someplace else, how to manage who can get to what resources. Peer-to-peer, -peer, anybody got two computers at home? Mm -hmm. Do you share information between them? Yes, do. So you have a peer-to-peer -peer network. You don't have a server that has a central database that allows you to log in, right? You may, but you probably don't. You certainly could. And then we'll have our other commercial here, MSDNAA account. Have all you guys signed up, registered, know what I'm talking about when I, when I say that? Free software. Oh, yeah. Did we, uh, did that get sorted with VMware? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I'll show you that. I don't know. I don't use VMware. I use Virtual PC. <laughs> we started out with, we started out with our virtualization. We started out using VMware on the desktop. Worked pretty good. And then we found this uh, server that allows you to work off campus via the web interface, and it works a lot better. Uh, we're working on right now, just as, as an aside, as an information, uh, a Hyper-V server that will be more efficient. Yeah, Hyper-V. Hyper That's Microsoft's uh, newer version of virtualization. It's the one that runs, run, the, the one that we run now is a piece of software that runs on top of the operating system. Hyper-V runs between the operating system and the hardware, so it makes it more efficient. Uh, a hypervisor is what they call it. Uh, but. And, and that's what uh, VMware uses, too. Each of them has their advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage to VMware, if you go into any kind of a large scale, is you got to pay for it. And if you've already bought the Microsoft server, Hyper-V comes for free. So me being a cheapskate, I like the free stuff. Free tools. Speaking of free tools, and <clears throat> there is... On the Internet, when we go through these things, and they have some of the tools in here, they're just people have tons of free tools. Solar Winds have a bunch of stuff that you can buy. They have this really expensive multi-thousand dollar called the, uh, the Engineer's Tool Set or something like that. But if you go look at their free tools, they have, I won't say hundreds, but probably tens of, of free tools. A lot of other places have those. Start 
finding things that work as we start doing the individual things. What works for you? What makes sense to you? What can you do with this tool? What can you monitor with it? Why would you want to monitor it? For instance, why, why would you care about your bandwidth in the middle of the night? Would you care? Sure. Sure, because what if somebody's hacked your network and is now using it as an FTP server to serve up their child pornography? What, the child pornography? Okay, let's just say they're a movie because that has actually happened <clears throat> at a place that I know it wasn't pornography, it's just a movie. Illegal, of course. But some guy just found this open FTP port, back to those port things. Do you know it's open? And we'll learn how to scan. How do you know it's open? What's well, open on your network at home kind of deal. But he just decided to put his movie there. And it was at a campus, and they said, oh, it's just all the students getting ready on the night before final exams. Yeah, right. Can you believe that one, too? Somebody had put a movie. It wasn't pornographic or anything else. It was just a movie, and he was sharing it to all of his friends on the Internet. 90% network utilization at 3 o'clock in the morning. Figure the odds. Those are the kinds of things that we learn how to monitor the tools to monitor that so that when something like that happens, then you can do more investigation. What's going on? What's causing this? Elements common to client-server networks, uh, specific uses for a network, and we'll do some of that. Specific uses, you guys probably know as many uses and other uses that are here. What What we really kind of focus on are the strictly business uses, although a lot of social networking businesses have gone to that because that's what people know how to use. That's what they use. If you're doing a Facebook update, you're probably more likely to go to my Facebook page than you are to my Moodle page. Is that is that a fairly safe statement? How can we, how can you integrate those things? And when we get into security, how can you integrate those things securely into your network? What do you allow? What do you not allow? An example of that, you can't get to Facebook in the classroom, right? We hope. Anybody tried? Yeah, you can. You can. can? Yeah. Do it. Do it. The only place I've seen you could do it. The only place I've seen you can do it is in the library, too. Yeah, that's where I did it. That's, that's where, where you did it. What do you get if you go to it in here? I don't know. Is it a yellow screen or a red screen? It's a blue screen. I think it says it's available in the, cli in the, in the library. Oh, I get the red but, screen. But, yeah, well, that's all based on character strings, and if you look really carefully, you can probably find something. The reason, and this is another service, and I guess that the, I just wander around, and, and maybe some of those, and, and when it comes back, I say, Oh, he said that about that on the first day. Proxy servers, where you get that from? A proxy server just goes and gets stuff. When we first put the internet, the higher speed internet, in here years ago, we had a bunch of students who were really big on porn. How do you block porn? Well, you go put a proxy server in and just block character strings. You run into some issues with that because if you block the the text screen sex. What if you want to go to Essex County? Mm -hmm. That character string is in Essex. So you, then you got to be real careful about what you do in those things. So some of those character strings, and when you get to places that you go, you know, you get you get links that are probably about a mile and a half long. Someplace in there, you get the red screen is one of those. Could be a three or four character string that is now forbidden. Uh, the same thing on the uh, can we get to Facebook? We just block it with the, with a proxy server. There are other things, DNS, and I'll start, and you'll hear me say this, and I'll say it and say it and say it. There is a service, a free service called OpenDNS that I try to get people to use for your DNS domain name service, and we'll talk about that later. That's the thing. It takes those really cool names that we like to do, you know, like skyline.edu and translates them into numbers. But it has some protections, adware and malware protections that keeps you out of those sites. It's worth 
worthwhile having, and they've got instructions there. And if you want to use it and you have problems, we, we can sit down and go through the process to how you would enable it on your network. It's not very complex to do. And then you can always go back, and if you have kids, none of you do, but you can always go back and see where they're going. Proxy servers do the same thing. You can always go back and see where they're going. These guys get to red screen and sit there, try to get on these porn sites for 30 or 40 minutes. So, oh, no, I just got there accidentally. Wrong. If you're there for three or four seconds because logs. That's the other thing that people don't understand that maybe we don't do the greatest job in the world with, but you need to know about logs. The Moodle site, several years ago, I guess the advantage and the disadvantage of being here so long is a lot of stuff happens. Uh, there was an English instructor, brand new English instructor, who came in and had a Moodle page, and her class didn't do the homework. And they came back in, so we couldn't get on Moodle. All weekend we couldn't get on Moodle. You go back and look at the logs. You know how many attempts there were? You know how many log on failures there were over that entire weekend? Yeah. One. And it wasn't any of them. It was kind of odd that the one student didn't manage to get on too, you know. So how do you do that? We took them each, and Roger Farmer, who you said you'd met someplace, did a remote desktop to his house and had them each log on to Moodle remotely from outside the campus. And you know what? Worked for every one of them. Logs, what's going on? Big deal. Really boring. Really, really boring. Lots of information in there. We were doing a class, and he was going to bring in a day's worth of firewall logs from here, from this campus. He's going to print them out and bring them in. He figured out it was like 2,000 pages. So when I say really boring, and then you'll have another class, I think, let me say, you may have another class, uh, a scripting class. You've got to find tools to help you manage those logs because you can get so much information in a log that it becomes unusable. There are tools that allow you to do that. That's all part of this career. Is it fun? Yep. Is it interesting? Yeah. Sometimes it's like an Easter egg hunt. What's causing it? How can you get there? And you know, you fix one thing and it breaks something else. Those are always fun. I'm good at that. I don't know if anybody else is, but I'm really good at that. Describe the 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 uses. I guess I've broken my uh, PowerPoint here. Some of the certifications available to network professionals. We'll talk about those if you want to. Talk about certifications. I'm probably the person to talk to. I have a number of them. I've taken a number of tests probably. I got my first certification, I think, was NetWare. Actually, it was A-plus in 1997. Uh, Microsoft, uh, MCSC, I, got the, I started with NT4 2000, 2003. 2008, they changed it to MCITP. Did that A-plus, Network Plus, Security Plus. CCNA, CCNP, CCNA Security, Ethical Hacker, which again that's the one I'm supposed to go to to get the up the new and new and improved version of it. So we can go through and I can show you where to get the test material. I tell you where to get the test material. The examcollection.com. Do not try to memorize questions. One, there's too many of them because on those test maps you're probably going to see. For Network Plus, if you go to a, net, a test bank, you probably see seven, eight, nine hundred questions. A lot of them are going to be duplicates, obviously, different ways to ask different questions. When you go to take the test, you're going to have a hundred questions. So, and, and you will not necessarily see them with the exact words that are there, or they may they'll change up just enough to mess you up. So you need to use those, I think, as a study guide. Yes, I know this. Yes, I know this. What are they talking about there? Go look it up. Try it out. Virtual computers are a really good way to try things out. Because if you mess it up, so what? You just delete. Oh, there's a file. You just delete it and start over. We'll give you another one. If you mess it up, one you want. If you want virtual machines to work on things like that, let us know. We'll certainly be happy to make you one so that you can use them. And we can go from XP. 
If you really want Vista, we have one of those. You don't. To Windows 7. When we get the Hyper-V, and one of the things that we can do in Hyper-V that we can't do in this one is use Windows 8 machines. Uh, you can't virtualize Windows 8 in the server that we're using right now because it has to run. It has to run in Hyper-V. Just one of those things. Kinds of non-technical or soft skills, and you said that somebody said you guys have customer service as your other class. Those are the soft skills that we're talking about. I don't know that Network Plus has any. Uh, a Plus has a couple of uh, customer. <coughs> service questions on it. One is, who's the most important customer, says the one standing right in front of you. How many of you ever been there doing something, the phone rings and they run away and talk to somebody for 30 minutes on the telephone while you're standing in the store? How does it make you feel? Are you the most important customer? They may answer the phone say, you know, can you hold because they have somebody there. Those are the kinds of things when they talk about soft skills. Networking is has some issues there too because when something breaks, what do you want to know? You want to know what happened. How are you going to figure out what happened? Questions. questions. What kind of questions? What'd you do? What'd you do? When did it happen? That's right. Well, that's what the answer is going to be. I just turned it on. I just turned it on and it just happened. But that goes back to documentation. In a Windows system, when do the changes actually get saved to the hard drive? When you log off. The changes that you make get written to the registry, but they don't actually take effect until you log off and log back on. So they, in fact, may have just turned the computer on. Somebody else may have made some changes. That's part of that documentation that we talked about earlier on, because yeah, you turn it on and something does happen. What happened? What changes were made to the machine? Were there some? Maybe, maybe not. But those kinds of things, asking questions, how do you ask those questions? And and the other thing in soft skills troubleshooting is can you replicate it? The most difficult things are the sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And you've all probably had those. You, those are really difficult things to to try to figure out. Why do why why do we use networks? Why do you guys use networks? How many of you have an entertainment network? I don't because I don't have anything new enough. But do have, does anybody have an entertainment network in your house? Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Honestly, we're lazy. We're lazy. Well, maybe we're lazy, but it's um, like for me, I set up a um, like a media server. A I media all server. All my music, all my movies are on. Are right the there on that server. That I can access from any computer in my mm -hmm. house. Yep. Any TV. Any TV. So you have network television. So that's why I, say I don't have anything. I don't have anything new enough. I can do that, but I have to add an intermediary in there. I have to add a laptop. Yeah. I can do that and. Yeah, well, I'm yeah, I'm a cheapskate. Though. I have a laptop, hey, that <laughs> and then connect it. So then I can connect to some other storage location. That way, you don't have to worry about where it is. You don't have to worry about writing DVDs and carrying them around. And will it play in those things? So, what we want to do: a group of computers or other devices that are connected by some type of transmission media. What does that mean? Some kind of wire? Does it have to be wire? Possibly. Does it have to be wire? It could be wireless. Could be wireless. Infrared. Infrared. We'll we'll say okay for infrared. Infrared pretty slow. <laughs> and then go very far. I have a that I used to use when I actually used the treadmill an infrared headset that connect because you know you turn on a treadmill you try to watch television you can't hear a thing. Well. The treadmill was too far from the television. <laughs> so the infrared, you got to get moved to treadmill. Infrared, absolutely. Wireless, 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz spectrum, the things that we normally think about wireless are the ones that are. 5 may be one that you really hadn't thought about, but if you look at the 802.11 in standard, 5 is part. 
if you get the dual band routers, five and two, both of them are going to be in there. Gives you a lot more flexibility as to number of devices that you can have. We could have what about light? What about fiber? We could use that. So we could have copper is a transmission media piece of wire. Different types of wire, and next week you're going to make some of this to see how this works. Create some uh, transmission media, and we'll bring in when we do that. I'll do. I'll try to do the chapter three lecture probably on Thursday, and then next week you can have like a hands-on week. Uh, bring in a bunch of examples of. Well, they got pictures, but I kind of like if you can see it. It's probably makes more sense than if you just see a picture of it. So connected together by some sort of transmission media could be a wired, which we're going to call bounded or unbounded. Unbounded would be the wireless. Unbounded because who can intercept your wireless signal? Anybody with a receiver. If you walk around with your laptop, we may take his laptop, no, we won't, but if you take your smartphone, how many of you have the wireless detector fingers on your on your smartphones? You ever walk out back and look? How many networks are out there? Or walk out front and look? That's what I like to do in a wireless class. There are a multitude of them. And some of them have these really cool names like State Farm. Golly, I know where I'm going now, don't I? So... Bounded and unbounded media, wired and wireless, basically. <clears throat> Advantages to using networks over standalones enable multiple users to share the media, just like in your media server. If you want to watch one movie and somebody else wants to listen to music, you can do that. Not on the same device, obviously, but you can do that. So it allows multiple users to do different things with a single source, and that's going to be a server, a client-server sort of relationship. To manage or administer resources on multiple computers from a central location. What if you don't want somebody to watch a movie? What if you have an adult movie and you have kids and you don't want them to be able to do it, to see it? You can restrict user access. When we get into permissions, you're grinning. Huh, funny, funny? Yeah. But you may want to restrict some access. What if here we don't want you in somebody else's home directory? Can we do that? And, in fact, we hope we have done that. Have you ever tried getting anybody else's home directory? I always like to try that just to be sure the, the, that the permissions haven't got messed up and they have been on occasion. People make changes and they don't really understand what they've done. The other thing that I would implore you have nothing to do with this topic. When you make changes on a network, try it out. See what happens. And don't try it out as an administrative user. Try it out as a regular user because you're going to find the world's a whole lot different as a regular user than as an administrative user. So try those things out when you change them. We can do all of those things. I don't think I'm telling anybody anything magic, and I don't expect to. Every computer can communicate directly with every other computer. Peer-to-peer -peer networks, and a lot of times you'll see peer-to-peer -peer networks not more than 10 computers. There's no networking restriction on that. Actually, there is no net BIOS. It's like 256. The 10 comes in as a Microsoft restriction. Because if you're connecting to a workstation, a Windows 7, a Windows XP, a Windows Vista, you can have 10 connections to that machine. On the 11th connection, it gives you some error message. It doesn't really say that anything except that you can't connect. That it's like it's not there, and you know it is because you can see it. You can ping it. You just can't connect to it. Peer-to-peer, -peer, every computer connects to every other computer. The earlier slide said that we can centrally manage using the server, which means that we can have on that server a list of usernames and passwords. Who can authenticate? Who can get resources there? The problem with a, one of the problems with a peer-to-peer -peer network is you got to have a username and password for every single person going to connect to it. 
So if everybody's connecting to everywhere, what, what happens when it comes around to password change time? You got ten machines. You go to ten machines and change the password ten times. Because there's no central storage where there is in the client server relationship. Advantages, disadvantages to each. The, the problem with client server, the disadvantage is you gotta buy server software in order to make it work. You can cheat the system. What if we had just like your media server, is it a is it a server operating system or is it a uh, workstation? Not anymore. Um I'm trying to think what I had. It was two thousand three I believe. When I got Windows seven, I tried it on that computer first. Um so I just pulled my media hard drives out. Yeah, and put it in your Windows seven machine. Yeah. Because you're not gonna have a lot of people connecting to it. Right. So it's actually, I mean, it's, it's yeah. a peer network. Yeah. And, that, and I was going to say, if you did that, you could take a workstation, make it your server, in quotes, not really server software, and put usernames and passwords for, for who you want to connect on that machine. Then you kind of are centrally managing what goes on. Uh, I found, I, I've started to use it quite a bit, the home network in Windows 7, Vista works pretty well when you do those things. No computer has more authority than the other one, and I don't necessarily like the word authority because in a client server, does the server have any more authority than the workstation? The only authority that it has, authority in my perception of the word authority is that Will it allow you to connect to it or not? Do the same thing with a workstation. Will it allow you to connect to it or not? And in fact, when we get into Windows, you're going to find out that the workstations and the servers have two services running on them. Oh, and one's a client, one's a server service. The server service allows you to share resources with other users. And that's what we want to do with networking in it. Be it in the house, in your own network, in your business, or across the internet. Sending and receiving information from every other computer, and this is the peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer is when we just connect workstations together individually. This is a peer-to-peer -peer network. This shows, put a new term in here, when we talk about topology, and that's going to be the next chapter. This would be a bus topology. The bus topology is kind of like a bus line, isn't it? Runs up and down, a bus goes down a particular path, set of streets. This is, and you can think of a wire, that it's a piece of wire, and they're all connected to the same piece of wire. So in a bus topology, everything's connected to the same piece of wire. Everything's going to see everything that's on the wire. It's kind of like being in a room. What do you hear? Do you hear... How, how, how many of you can say something secretly in here in a normal tone of voice? Couldn't do it, could it? Because we're all in the same media. So that is that picture. So client server, have we beat that one to death enough? Client server got a central machine that has usually the differentiation is it can have more connections. The software allows more connections and you can centrally manage who can have access to the resources. What does that mean centrally manage? Uh, one person does it. One person does it from a single location. If you want to change your password in a client server, you change your password here. How many computers do you have to change your password on? Just one. What if it were peer-to-peer -peer and we have 300 computers? How many computers would you have to change your password on? 300, 300 of them. That would be a real pain, wouldn't it? Client server versus peer-to-peer. -peer. Computer must be running. This is one. NOS, and this is a term to know, network operating system. To be designated as a server, really it doesn't. Because the workstations, the Windows 7, the Windows XP, the Windows 2000, I guess the Windows NT 
workstation all have a service running on it called a server service, which allows us to put movies and music and everything else and share. And share means that we allow other people from remotely, from remotely, to remotely access those resources. So we can create a server, we can call it a server by simply using that service. If you want people to not be able to do that, if you really want to lock them down, turn that service off. Then you can't do any sharing. You can't do, because you can do, if we talk about files, you can do the same thing with printers. How many people have multiple printers at home on your multiple computers? Do you have multiple printers? Mm -hmm. Wow. Two upstairs, one downstairs. Two upstairs, I got one. But you can still share the printer if you wanted to. Understand three different businesses. So you want to keep the if you want to keep things separate, absolutely you can do that. But you can still share printers also, as well as we've talked about files, the resources. We can files being the movies and the music and whatever else that we want. This PowerPoint that I'm using right now is a client-server relationship. I logged on to the network and I went to. This folder over there on the server called Students Apps, and then go on down into the folders to find this PowerPoint presentation. Most of the concepts in the network pertain to the client server networks. They don't, and they do, because would we set up a moderately expensive network to run on a peer to peer? Small business probably does. I used to do some work for a dentist down here, and he had everything set up. Had a machine, a desktop, and this was XP days, that was his, quote, server, unquote. His database with all of his client information, all of his patients and all that were on a central machine that all of the employees in the business could connect to. So that, in a loose sense of the word client server, when they say client server, they're actually talking about something that's running the network operating system, a server operating system, a server 2003, a server 2008, a server 2000, a server 4.0, a network server, a Linux server. So they're really talking about managing centrally and moving, connecting and storing information in those areas. This is, and we get a different topology here, don't we? The other one had a single piece of wire that everything was connected to. Now this one's got this, and they put a hub in here, a hub, yeah, maybe we'll talk about the difference between a hub and a switch. You're probably going to see in reality in today's networks a switch. Look very similar to a bunch of them back there on the shelves. Hubs and switches back there. If you look at them, say, oh, they all look the same. They got these little plugs, right? Yeah, one faster than the Maybe. One's faster than the other. Maybe. We'll talk about we'll talk about why, and the answer is probably, but not necessarily. So. The hub, this is going to be called a, the other one we said was a bus topology, the single wire. This is going to be called a star topology. Star because what they always say is you set this thing in the middle of the room. Well, look around this room and look in the back. See how in the middle they are? And one of them actually goes to the room next door. Because they don't, I don't know why they put it in here. Just to make more noise, I guess. But star topology just means that we have a central device. See any problems there? No problems with that, right? No, well, somebody no. kicks the plug out of that device. A weak point. You're always going to have those. We talk about, oh, we created a single point of failure. What doesn't have a single point of failure? What if the battery dies in your car? Is that a single point of failure? What if the router going to the Internet dies? What if your home router dies? Single point of failure. What if your switch dies? Single point of failure. What if the server dies? And hopefully we have it backed up. But 
single point of failure, bus topology, and a star topology. Log on accounts, passwords assigned in one place. You see that. What happens when you want to change your password around here? You get this warning message starting two weeks in advance, right? So is your password about to expire in 14 days? Do you want to change it now? Your password is about to expire in 13 days. Do you want to change it now? If you don't change it, you can't get on the move from home, by the way. It uses the same database. So you eventually change it. It's changed on the server in a service called Active Directory that allows that to happen. Access to multiple shared resources can be centrally granted to a user or to a group of users. If you will go to the run and do backslash backslash RKE dash storage, you'll see all of the shared resources. You'll see one that says student home. And you go in there, student home, and you'll see a whole bunch of fold, file folders in there. Should be one for each student. And you can double click on somebody else's and hopefully it'll say no. You can double click on yours and open it up. So we can manage, and how do we manage that? We centrally give permissions. We can manage that. If you want to change your password, you can change your password, control all the late reset password. Or if you forgot it, you can go over and talk to Chris. He'll reset it for you. Reset in one location, back to the single, single spot for these things. Optimize to handle heavy processing. The, the server software itself is designed for multiple user connections. The desktop software isn't designed. It allows that, but it's not designed to do that. Usually will manage more resources. Uh, a 64-bit, actually let's go to 32-bit, because I can remember a 32-bit Windows 7 computer can have how much memory? 3.76 gigs. 3.76 gigs. It's limited by the number of bits. <clears throat> Theoretically, four, but the BIOSes and Windows typically limit that. The server that we're using to run the virtual machines on, <clears throat> they have to have hardware that allows that. It's got, I think, 96 gig of memory in it. The operating system allows us to put that much in. <clears throat> when they originally put it in, Somebody told him to put in the standard server, and he got limited to 48 gig or something like that. So it's not working. So you got to have the enterprise version. Allows more memory. Each of them may allow, will allow, have different restrictions. How do you find that out? The only way to do that is go look it up, because that changes. That changes from version to version, what can and what can't. And from 32 to 64 bit, the reason I did 64 bit because it's it's a much higher number how much will it actually manage. LANs, MANs, and WANs. Before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and take a break here. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the definitions here, which are kind of like word definitions, and then when we start doing the OSI model, I'm going to tell you that I wasn't entirely truthful. How about I'm going to tell you I'm going to lie, and then I'm going to tell you why later on when we start breaking down the OSI model. Because they always do these things and people come up and say, oh yeah, win big. Well, yeah, maybe. So, let's take a break. Okay, so let's talk about these lands, mans, and wins. And the definition we're going to get here are pretty local area network, local small area. Building, set of buildings, office building, something like that. And this is going to be the English version. When we get to the OSI model, when we get to all the way up to layer two, we'll find out that there really is a technical differentiation of these things. Metropolitan area network, larger than a land, but smaller than a land. Roanoke, for instance. And I think that they were trying to put in, a number of municipalities were trying to put in metropolitan area networks to do that. These are each going to have their own, nasty word here, protocols set of rules to define how they work. And then a wide area network connects two or more geographically distinct lands or mans. We'll take that right now, kind of. I want to say, that, do, do, you, do they really have to be geographically distinct? No. 
They just have to meet the definitions. What is a WAN? A technical definition. But for right now, and these are the things that you're going to see a lot. What are land WANs and MANs? And as we go on, next time we'll say, oh, well, this is what really defines a land. This is what really defines a, a MAN. This is what really defines a WAN when we do these things. So a WAN link, and they did kind of do kind of a neat thing here. This symbol here, and I just had a guy came back, gave him a drawing to do a set up a network for a router lab. One of those guys are working on. He said it looks like a wireless. That's a, that's the symbol for a serial link. And we'll look at serials, lands. What do we use? How much speed? What kind of connector are we using? Is what you're really talking about here? What speeds do these things go? And we got a couple of things here. We got this neat WAN link, and we got a router and a router. So routers define networks. Routers connect networks, and these routers are connected together so that we can connect the networks together. You'll do a lot more of that in the uh, in the routers classes. So the client server, we got to have a client, obviously. What's client? End user. End user. Client, somebody wants something. Eh? If you don't want something, why why go? Why connect? Server is got something. So the client is us. We want something. The server, the thing that got something. Workstation, workstation and client. I think you'll see used interchangeably. Workstation is a computer. Client in this in this sense, we're kind of talking about us, the the user, the client user. But you'll frequently see the workstation referred to as a client or the client machine. The network interface card, the NIC, and a lot of these things are now built onto the motherboards. They may be distinct hardware devices. We've got a whole bunch of junk back here. Uh, and here's a really nice old one. It's got two different kinds of media connections on it. Network interface card, huh? It's got coax as well as an RJ45. You can't hurt this stuff. Because it's already been hurt. But oh, there's a circuit card. And what that circuit card does is take what we typed on the computer, you know, our Microsoft Word document or whatever, the web page, and we want to send it, and transforms it to a different format, to a format that can be put on, into, that is put into ones and zeros and can be put on the wire. Network operating system and OS for the server itself. Host, and here we get into a lot of different things. A host can be a computer, host machine. And I think what they do, I think this is the book that a host, one of them is a NetBIOS, which we haven't talked about yet, and the other one is a fully qualified domain name, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. But host is going to be a machine here. Node. Same thing. A node is basically anything that can have an address. A node can be a printer could be a node because it can have an address. Computer can be a node because it can have an address. A node is just simply something on the network that has an address. A connectivity device, these things that we allow to connect devices together. It could be a hub switch, and we're going to talk about which layer when we get the OSI, the equipments that operate there what they do. We'll take a little bit of a look at them. Uh, how do we connect the computers together? Could we connect them together with a piece of wire? As long as we've got the right kind of wire, absolutely. But what else could we connect if we if we connected two computers together? Well, i got one NIC. Our network is now a grand total of two machines, right? What if we want more than that? Then we need these other devices that you've seen, heard, whatever, hubs, switches. And if we want to connect networks and get some isolation, we're going to have to have routers also. Ready yeah. There's the NIC that you just had. Segment. Network segments 
are parts of a network, let's put it that way. We can connect seg what what we're gonna do with segments is try to create some isolation when we start talking about traffic and how much traffic you have in each of these things. We can create segments to have computers that communicate with each other in one area, maybe in this room we've got a bunch of machines on one one side of the aisle and a bunch of machines on the other side of the aisle. So we would have the machines on the right side of the aisle be a segment. They're all connected together. And the machines on the left side would be a segment. They're all connected together. Now we need a connecting device, and we're going to call this thing a bridge, that will bridge between the two segments. So that if the machines on the right-hand side are connected with each other, no problem. They don't go to the ones. The traffic doesn't go to the machines on the left-hand side. But if you're trying to go to one of the machines on the left-hand side, the bridge says, oh, yeah, I know where that thing is, and sends it to the other side. So what you do is limit the amount of traffic that's on the media that's on the wire by creating segments. A backbone is simply a high-speed connection. When you talk about, we talk about some of the high-speed stuff on the Internet, we're going, to, we're going to talk about tremendous speeds, OC48 is is... is Something I mean, so like a hundred gig or something like that, ninety-eight gig, something ridiculous. something ridiculous. Backbone's a high-speed connector, and you can have the same thing on networks. You have if you have two, maybe two uh, buildings connected together, you might have a backbone between the two buildings, a higher speed or a different type of media that doesn't have anything else connected to it to allow that transmission. Topology. What's topology in general? <clears throat> it's the type of network you're working with. But in general, let's let's go bigger. Let's go bigger. What's the topology in the Roanoke area? Well, demographics. Demographics. What's the topology? Ah, so you guys back to the English class. What's the to what is the topology? Is it mountainous? What's the topology of it's a valley. Norfolk? Because plains plains be flat. Topology is kind of like we were talking about earlier. We had that we had those three computers connected to that single piece of wire. And the bus topology. Bus topology. We had those computers connected to that hub or switch. Star topology. The other topology that we're going to talk about is a ring. Everything is in a ring. We're going to have different access. And again, when we talk about the OSI model, what do those mean to us? Protocol. What's a protocol? Language. Language. Set of rules that we do those things with. Data packets, when we package this stuff up, the information, put it on the wire itself. And that's going to have information. It's also going to have an awful lot of overhead in order to get it, what's really amazing is the amount of overhead, the amount, the number of wrappers that go onto the data to get it to a specific location. So it really takes a lot. If you go on the internet, do you ever think about how many places you're actually going to get there? How do you how do you get there? It's a pretty smart place. And how do you get there efficiently? That's what all of the Information that or all of the what we'll call header information, all of the overhead that wraps the data up allows us to do that. <laughs> Addressing, we're going to have two types of addresses. We're going to have a hardware address called a MAC address, and we're going to have a logical address called an IP address in order to get from one location to the other. IP addresses define networks. MAC addresses define individual devices. Every NIC has a hardware address. Home routers have hardware addresses, and that's how they restrict what's going to go on. Transmission media, you'll make some of it. We'll look some of that. Some of it comes and goes. The NIC that we passed around had a connection for a coax. We don't really use coax anymore. It's pretty slow. But... It's available should you want to use it with that one. There it goes. I think so. Backbone, again, this is showing a backbone here, and what it's showing is the between the router here is the backbone. 
So what they're talking about the backbone here. That break this. Backbone here. Switch switch the router in between here. The backbone is the connection across these devices. And again, backbone is just connecting two different, and in this case, segments together, which are normally going to be a high speed connectivity. Higher speed. When you get on the internet, they're really high speed. You know why we always put the internet in the cloud? Because there's always a cloud, right? You call it cloud services, the internet's the cloud. I'm not sure anybody knows what actually goes on inside there. What it is is a big switching network, big routing network device. Phone companies run an awful lot of it. That worked well, didn't it? Yeah, if I can make it work right. A couple of different topologies here. And I'll try to scroll some more. The bus. Notice on the bus. Maybe I'll try to scroll some more. See, first it wouldn't go back to mouse, now it won't go to pen. Now it's on pen and it won't go backwards because once you're in pen, you got to stay in pen. So, let's try this one more time. On the bus, everything's connected to the same media, which means that Everybody can see what everybody else is sending. Is that so very good? Depends on what you need. All you just you just put in the password for your bank account. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. And the devices that we use are going to kind of dictate that what kind of separation we get. But they're set up so that the hardware address only accepts information that's going to it. Everything else is out there. And if we can figure out some way to get it, all the better for us, right? And we figured out a way to get it. We just sniffed the network. What a star is, and what I want to do is a switch or a hub in here, what you really kind of sort of do, and or it's still going to be a bus. What you do is put a box around this bus, shrink it. If you want to think about how this thing is still a bus, it's a star topology, physical topology. We have physical topologies and logical topologies. The physical topology. So this is a star. It's a it's a physical star. It's still going to be a logical bus. Take the bus, put the box around it, shrink it. So we put the bus inside the box. A ring topology is simply that. It is a ring, and the traffic goes around the ring. And this is token passing. This is what's called a token ring. Not really popular anymore. Uh, what we use is actually none of these. We use fast Ethernet, and we'll talk about the differences in those. Again, when we get to the OSI model, what, what makes those different? Ring, you have to have the token in order to put traffic on the wire. So token ring, hybrid just mixes different types of, of media. So we have physical, and the physicals that we have here are bus and ring. Logical is a star. The logical star, if you look around the building and you look around most places, is what most of us are using. We're using, shows a hub, but we're using switches, the next device up, next most efficient device. And when we look at that, it's going to give you a number of advantages in security also. The media, and again, we'll make media. Some different pictures of here. 
some of them so good, some of them not so good. When we talk about it, we'll, we've, we've got a, a bunch of old stuff that's around that that you can look at, feel it, see what it actually looks like. Coax, you're still going to see it around, but I think what we're going to use that mostly for is television. Shielded twisted pair and unshielded twisted pair going to be basically the same thing, except the shield has some sort of a shielding around it, usually a woven metal. Sometimes it's just a piece of foil. A lot of coax that you see now, it's got a shield, it's just got a piece of foil around it. What that does is prevents interference from outside, uh, outside radio waves and electromagnetic waves. Fiber optic, optical cable, and, and this is a uh, Kevlar, typically, that's put in here to shield or to protect the fiber itself. If you ever work on this stuff, follow all the safety rules. Trust me. It is glass. doesn't feel like glass. doesn't seem like glass till you get stuck in you. And it really feels like glass. And if you get in your eye, it really feels like glass. And they're very, very tiny. And you need to use all the safety precautions when you do this. And then the other media down here, radio waves, can be either... RF or light. We'll go back to your infrared. And a lot of you probably use infrared transmitters, don't you? TV remote, typically. Not all of them are, but typically the TV remote is going to be uh, on IR. What somebody told me in a class, and they're absolutely right, is they're actually starting to go to RF for some of those, for the for the short range. Uh, just, just like the headset, the Bluetooth headset that you use is 2.4 gigahertz wireless that I can hopefully wander around and maybe make some sense out of some stuff. Network services, functions provided by a network. What kind of network services? You have media server, media services. We have web servers, print servers, databases. databases. May have a modem bank on a server. Maybe. I guess not so much anymore. Or fax, fax machines on it. File services is one of the big things that we use in these, and, it's, and that's what you're using with your media server. We call it a media server, but you're really serving files up. Print services, so that we can have a single printer. You guys all had multiple printers. I'm, again, the cheapskate in the crowd. I have one printer. I walk upstairs. It's a long walk. Too. But one, a single printer. Why? Costs a lot less, a lot less maintenance. Don't have to buy as much supporting materials, ink cartridges, I'm still in the inkjet world, when we when we do these things. Communication services to connect to the network, remote access server, communication server, remote access server. If we, and when we go to this uh, Hyper-V system, what you'll have to do is from home, we will get it from home is you'll have to create a VPN connection to the remote access server. So you create a VPN connection from your computer at home to the remote access server, and then you can connect to using a remote desktop to your virtual machine that's inside the network. But the remote access server allows us to access internal devices remotely, things other than web pages. Mail services, mail servers, we use those. We're, we're all kind of locked into, addicted to, can't do without email now, right? What do we ever do without email? I know everybody's into texting now. Huh? Talk to each other. Yeah, there's a, there's a novel concept, isn't it? Yes, we actually did. And we wrote letters. And kept and kept the, and kept the post office. Well, you've never been deployed very far, have you? No, I wrote letters. Yeah. I, wrote letters. I yeah. remember you could, you know, in Afghanistan or Iraq, all you got to do is yep. get a piece of paper right free up in yep, the right corner. Yep, that's right. Yep, free. Frank. Frank postage, exactly. So, yeah. Keep a, but that didn't keep the post office in business. If you weren't if you weren't in the combat zone, you had to put stamps on keep the keep the post office in business, right? Uh, post office is going down there. Internet services. Web pages, web server, all of those things. Web server is just a service that's running on a server, just a service that you would add to it. You can run that on a Windows 7 machine. Don't have as many connections, but you can. You're, we're back to the 10 connections. 
but you can run a web server on it. Management services centrally administer these things so that we can reduce our administrative effort. Use those words, that's Microsoft's favorite words for questions. How do you do this using the least administrative effort? Then I give you four correct answers. But you gotta figure out what their least administrative effort is. Traffic monitoring control, load balancing. Load balancing, we have for something that's particularly busy, we have two different machines that give access to the same resource. Licensing, security auditing, nice list of things there. Mastering the technical challenge, installing, and configuring. How hard is it to install this stuff for real? We make it like it's really difficult. It's just a matter of clicking and saying okay, right? It really is in most cases. Not always. But what's the trick? Why do you need all this all these classes then? So don't screw it up when we do, do it. Don't screw it up when you do it. How many businesses do you think have given away the business because Microsoft made it so easy to put a web server in? And had everything else in the world running on the web server and put it out on the Internet, and all of a sudden everything's compromised. How does it work? Installing, configuring, troubleshooting, network hardware, network software. Networking has gotten a little bit, actually a lot more sophisticated, a lot more reliable. <clears throat> and it's also gotten to the point that you actually need fewer people. Five years ago, actually let's say eight years ago or ten years ago, if I wanted to install Microsoft Office and I just pick it because it's something that's easy on 300 computers in this building, what would I do? I go sit down 300 computers and install Microsoft Office. If I want to install Microsoft Office on 300 computers now, what do I do? I create a policy, and when the computer starts, it automatically installs. So networkers are still there. You need to know how to do these things. And are you going to remember the, the clicks? And that's my favorite word, the clicks. You can always find the clicks. What you got to know, need to know, need to remember are the kinds of things that you can do with these and how these things are going to work together. Characteristics of different transmission media, and that gets into what are we going to use where. When we get into the transmission media, we'll, we'll go into the specifics of that. The network design, <clears throat> we'll touch on that, but not to a great extent. The network design is going to be more in the, uh, in the routing area. What are you going to do? How are you going to break it up? How are you going to minimize traffic? How are you going to make it more secure? Simply by the way you do the network design itself. Network protocols, how users interact with the network. This is just a list of things that are coming, so I'm not going to try to comment on each of these things. A network client servers, media, and connect connectivity devices. You'll get to do that enough that you'll be sick of it by the time you get done. Soft skills. All these things you're going to learn in your other class, right? Customer relations. And they are important. Certification, so you know we're getting to the end of this presentation. Certification will help you get an interview. It's not going to get you a job. It's not going to make you an expert. The certifications are generally considered, the comp teal is generally considered entry level. The reason that employers like those is they can count on a certain baseline level of knowledge so that they kind of got an idea of what they're getting. They're not impossible to pass. Actually, the last block, I was doing the second half of the A+, because we do it in two parts also, and four, I think, four have already passed the A+, test, and a couple of them are supposed to take it this week. Uh, Network Plus, you can find the test banks to review. Again, please don't try to memorize the questions. 
some of the different certifications, the MCSC, CNE, they got the netware. CNE, not as important anymore in the U.S. anyway as it has been in the past. Uh, netware is a server operating system. They don't. They didn't make a client. Microsoft made a client and a server. Server 2008, Windows 7, the client, Server 2008, the server software. Netware just makes servers. The advantage that Netware had was they just worked. There is a story that goes back that apparently is true. University of North Carolina lost a server. It didn't crash. It just slowly couldn't find it. Physically lost it. Ran for like a year and a half. <clears throat> what they found out, they were doing some construction. Here, anybody do construction and put a wall up? I don't care what's there. They put the wall up. They put the wall up, and the server was inside it. It didn't melt? Hmm? It didn't melt? Didn't melt. Machine? Nope. Wow. It was a network server. And that was the, the, you didn't really have to reboot them. And you didn't have to do a haul with them. They just ran. Network Plus, CompTIA, the CompTIA test, A Plus, Network Plus, Security Plus. When you do certifications, this is my, my commercial on certifications, use your vouchers to pay for the expensive tests. CompTIA costs more. If you're going to get, when you get into, if you're going to take Microsoft, as long as you're a student, Microsoft gives a 50% discount to students. And their tests generally cost less. I think Security Plus is $260, Network Plus $200 something dollars. A Plus each of them is around $200. It's two tests for A Plus. So use your $15 vouchers for those. Microsoft tests for a student still under $100. So do those. C and E, don't, don't even worry about it. Because they're basically, they're basically bankrupt as far as I can tell. I think it's they've sold the parts off. Find a job in networking. I'm not even going to go there because they're going to do that with you. You're going to do enough of the of those kinds of things in your uh, in the career orientation and things like that. One of the thing, one thing that you may want to do attend career fairs as they have them around here. Go look and see what's available. What are people hiring? And when you look in the Roanoke Times and you find, what, four or five jobs, go look in the Washington Post. Am I telling you to go to Washington? No. Am I telling you that you may or may not find the job that you're looking for in the Roanoke Valley? Yeah. There are like somewhere around 2,300 IT jobs in Washington. Right. All right. I've got a number that's growing, too. Steady, yep. Government's growing. That's what yeah. <laughs> Government is growing. Enlist a recruiter, you may or may not want to do that. Ms. Lawrence gets a lot of jobs, and she will direct you to the jobs as you go through there. A couple of people have done that. I don't know that they got anything any better or not. The other thing that you may want to start doing is as you find these magazines, professional magazines that are generally going to be free, sign up. You, you may have to... Uh, usually they'll let students have them. Sometimes you may have to say, oh, yeah, I'm a network. I'm a network manager. Well, if you've got a network at home, you're a network manager, right? <laughs> so, those, yeah, managed, managed entertainment network. See? There are a number, and I don't know that these are necessarily accurate, but there are a lot of professional organizations. Look at them. Not all of them cost you, but take a look particularly at the Mac and the online libraries. Uh, Microsoft Redmond, I think redmondmag.com or something like that. Redmond is a, it's a magazine that is the, they call themselves the independent voice of Microsoft. They're kind of pro-Microsoft, but they're not just blindly following. They'll, they'll point out the issues as well as everything else. There are a number of those things. So we know what a network is. You already knew that, right? And you all network every day. You create networks. You use networks at home. Peer-to-peer -peer client server, I know I talked too long on all of this stuff, but 
whether you've got workstations talking with you. And the real issue here is whether you have a central database, whether you have central authentication. Yes, the, the servers have different operating systems, probably going to manage more memory. We were talking about that a little bit. Different levels of the server operating systems. And we share data, and that's the whole issue of this whole thing, isn't it? It's to be able to share whatever it is, data, music, videos, homework, just you. <laughs> the reason I always use that is if you're the network administrator and somebody gets there and puts their child pornography on <coughs> your network, guess who gets arrested? You do. You do. Unless you, and then you can always show that you've taken precautions to prevent that. That's a mitigating circumstance. But you need to really be careful about that stuff. What you, I'm sorry? You still got arrested. You still got arrested. You still, yeah, you still have that, you still get to do the perp walk, right? The services, talk about it, and there are a lot of those. What do you want to do? What don't, don't you want to do? Certification is a process of mastering material. Certification is a process of taking a bunch of tests. When you take these tests, and I can't get off this one, can I? Don't try to read something into the question. You may get questions that don't have a correct answer as a selection. What's the best answer? You may get questions that have four correct answers. What's the best answer? That's why don't try to memorize questions. I remember going to take a uh, a netware test. The C the C and E the stuff is no longer valid. I did a question bank before I went over, and I got a question exactly the same words in the question. All four of the answers were different. Use the questions as a study guide. What do I know about these things? Do you have questions? Going once, going twice. Let's take a break and then we'll get into the into the online activities.